working with, I'm Amanda Saunders. I'm a senior standards manager at BSI. I've been here five years. I have a team of people who have committees in the ESG space. So they are working on standards on environmental matters, social matters and governance matters. And um, we'll tell you exactly how standards get made, get proposed, and, and that's really what goes on in my team. <coughs> Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself while I cough? Sorry. <laughs> so my name's Sarah Walton. I've been at BSI for some years now, working in lots of areas of, around standards development in the standards body. Um, I'm currently in something called the sector team, which is um, where we engage much more directly with um, stakeholders about specific um, areas of their own sector and the things that interest them and, and obviously a lot of new and emerging um, ways of doing things, technologies, etc., which which can um, affect that particular sector. And my mine is the agri, agri-food, agri-tech sector. So um, I, I have a, a, a lot to do with the food and drink um, industry. Um, and I've just been on a, um, a secondment to Bayes, a department of uh, business energy and industrial strategy on um, looking at how uh, standards can assist the transition towards net zero. So uh, a lot of sustainability work I do as well. Lovely, next slide, thanks. Okay, so actually we're going to introduce you to somebody else. So um, Elaine, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself and tell everybody how you've been working with Innovate UK, Innovate Edge. Um, but the, this, yeah, I just wanted to say that this uh, training program is part of a wider program that we're doing with Innovate UK. So this is the second year of the Business Growth Toolkit program, where we give access to the innovation and growth specialists, innovation leads, and this year SMEs to our standards uh, library platform called BSI Knowledge. Um, and around that access to standards, we're developing training modules to help. Um, organizations and innovation leads and growth specialists to understand the benefits of standards and how to use standards uh, once they have them uh, and we have various supporting activities around that as well if you have any questions on standards please uh, refer to uh, your contacts at the national inquiry gateway and they will triage any questions and send them to us uh, to to respond to if they can't respond to them uh, and we will do that in a in a timely manner we also have a dedicated web page that um, hosts various different articles that we think will be of interest and help you to use standards um, that's the main goal of, of the program um, and there's links up there to the web page and also to the business growth email for the national inquiry gateway should you have any questions on standards um, and look out for for training courses that will be coming up in specific topic areas so this year we're looking at supply chain management innovation management and uh, equality diversity and inclusion uh, so watch out for those training programs thanks very much ladies Thanks, Elaine. Next slide, please. Over to you, Sam. Right. So, um, <clears throat> as I'm, I'm sure you're already aware, um, quite aware of, of, of BSI um, uh, being as your part of Innovate Edge, um, and we are, of course, the UK's national standards body. Um, but we're part of a wider group of companies. But 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 we today we're talking to you from the from the standards body and standards development part of that. So the there is there is only one standards body for the UK. Uh, we're quite unique in that. Um, and there's one standards body for every nation who is, for example, part of ISO. We were founding members of ISO, um, and also Sen and Senlec, um, which of the European standards bodies. So we. We have a, a great reach across the world, obviously part of, a, of being, you know, collaborating with those other member bodies in within ISO, for example, where we provide that route into standards making for UK interests. Um, and also because we have uh, teams working on international projects to help other countries in their you know, capacity building for developing uh, the ways in which standards can assist their own infrastructure. Okay, we're moving on. <laughs> Apparently we're moving on. <laughs> but 
there you are that that was essentially what we do um uh, so i just wanted to briefly mention the um that that we're part of that the other part of the group which you probably are aware of are the certification body um which of which there are there's more than one so there's only one national standards body but there are obviously other certification bodies apart from bsi there's dnv bureau of veritas lawyers register others as well that that perform validation and verification and certification to schemes which are often based on standards and that was all i wanted to say thanks thanks sarah next slide please so we are going to give you quite a bit of detail about who bsi is actually that first slide is really we are at the national standards body and this tells you a little bit more about how we make standards and how we work with other standards organisations. So BSI is the NSB for the UK and we manage in UK input into European and international standards. So you can see the um, things at the very top. We have the international standards and then we have regional standards, then we have national standards and then we have sponsored standards. And so if we were to create a sponsored standard, which is a fast track standard, um sponsored perhaps by an organization government institution anybody might want to get a standard out quickly into the market that may then become a british standard or maybe we may send take it into sen which is a european standards body or we may take it into iso so things go up um and international standards are the, are the uh, applicable to everybody um bsi also produces because we're really quite good at making standards we produce other private and professional guidance standards if anybody wants them Next slide, please. OK, so we're going to play a little video. It, um, it's pretty fast and you have to jump in pretty quick and try and hear it. But it does give you a little a little flavour of how standards are used and how prevalent they are. Thanks, Flora. Hi, everybody. I hope everybody could hear that. Sarah was saying she couldn't hear it through her headphones different headphones, different ways of listening in are really complex, the different systems. So sorry if you couldn't hear it. You, you'll have these slides so you can obviously go and have a look at these um, films and, and share them with your clients as well. They are quite useful. And that one in particular, it had little paper airplanes with EN 6204, which is probably a European standard on roundabouts and BS 20,400 and ISO 9001. You're going to hear these identifiers, these numeric identifiers all the time. And we get used to them and we use them a lot. Um, and we have to have a way of talking about standards and I'm afraid that's it. But yeah, I'm sorry, it's it's a bit exclusive. If you could Because there are so many of them. There's so many. <laughs> and we know, quite, we know quite a lot now, having been here for a few years. So we will use a few identifiers. Hopefully 9001 is a, is a one that you'll have heard of and that's the quality management standard and i think we will talk about that from time to time throughout next slide please um do put in the chat if you've got any problems with sound that little chat there's a little downward arrow you can expand it you can just type a message in there i i thought this was a nice segue you talking about the num the numeric things and into our poll here so there we go <laughs> <laughs> all right so what do you think how many british standards are there can have a go please vote very excited that you think there's 90,000, but we're very, very busy just working on 33,000. So yeah, there's 33,000 British standards at the moment. These numbers, they, they, they don't really mean very much to me. I, I don't know what although, that means. although I will say that there are on BSI knowledge, there are, we have other standards which were, which are like ASTM standards. So they're very technical ones, which have been, that which are not necessarily ones that we have worked on, but which we, we have, a, um, access to so because but Sarah, this one it says British standards is actually talking yeah. about all of the standards it's talking about ISO standards mm. and yeah. standards yeah. because what happens is we adopt them so in the UK we adopt standards that come from Europe obviously from being a member of the European Union we always had an understanding we would adopt them and even now that we've had Brexit we're still adopting all standards from the European Union we do not always adopt every standard from ISO if we feel we have a better british standard i believe that's the case and i should just say that we're, it's not the european union that we're adopting standards from it's from the 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 european standards bodies yes yes of doing. course but it, yeah it just was that sort of world that that had yeah. but we have we continue to have the understanding yeah european union notwithstanding so there's a couple of links on that page one to some facts and figures we can have just a quick look at that 
which tells you a little bit more broadly about BSI as a whole, actually, because we, as Sarah said, we're not just the national standards body. We actually do a lot of other things. I think probably many of you will be aware of our kite mark and the fact that we certify against many of our standards. But as Sarah said, we are not the only standards, the only certification body in town. There are many others, but we do a lot of other work, including working with the likes of you. We've got 12,200 committee members, and we're going to tell you a bit more about who they are. They are all volunteers. They, you know, there's lots of reasons why they volunteer to and really give huge amounts of their time to, to work on standards, and we love them for it. Um, they, they really are our lifeblood. A couple of points at the bottom here. Um, the quality management system standard, I told you I'd mention it a lot, ISO 9001, actually started life at BSI in 1979 as BS 5750. And it is now recognised as the world's most successful standard, having been adopted by more than a million organisations in 178 countries. And actually, many more than that may well be using that standard, but simply not certified, so we wouldn't really know about that. Um, but similarly, we also started off the, the Environmental Management System Standard, another, another number for you, ISO 14001, you might have heard of. I can't remember, that also began life at BSI as a BS and now is widely recognised as a very important standard environmental management. And the final one, just to sort of let you know, another really nice and interesting standard that some of your clients might be interested in, particularly post post Brexit, post COVID, post or in the middle of a you know Ukraine war, we we have a really nice standard, a British standard still on organisational resilience, which provides guidance on how to be able to anticipate, prepare for, respond, and adapt to incremental change and sudden disruptions. And we gave that standard away to tens of thousands of people during the COVID pandemic. And that was really exciting because actually we love to get our standards out there and have them used. Um, that has now been revised and just publishing, I think, in the next week or so, uh, or perhaps it's just published. I, I don't quite know. Um, but a really nice standard and one that you sh should have a look at. So that will be a BS 65,000 colon 2022 now. Um, back to BSI, we have committees of industry representatives who draw up standards. Around two and a half thousand standards a year are, ma are made or revised and then a similar number are withdrawn. So our committees, these volunteers that I told you about, can develop national British standards or contribute to the development of standards at an international level via the ISO or via CEN. Um, BSI's national committees nominate members to represent them on these international standards committees. So that that is like a core reason that a lot of our committee members get involved is they don't get to just work on British standards but they can also take the UK view into Europe into you know, globally. Um, 13,000 active committee members who I said we love, 1,200 technical committees which take quite a bit of management. Next slide please. Okay so who is on these committees? First of all, BSI doesn't doesn't write standards. It doesn't come really come up with ideas for standards. We we respond to industry needs and consumer needs and all sorts of other needs. So we build a standards committee that fits whatever the subject matter is. So if we have a water quality um, committee, we would we would ensure that we had the right government departments on that. We might invite the environment agency or we might invite professional institutions like the Water Management Society or trade associations, certification bodies, consumer bodies, we might be doing something on Legionella or Pseudomonas in swimming pools and we might want a consumer view of that. We might want people from enforcement or education. Lots of academics get involved in standards, um, standards users and research organisations. So we really take care to build our committee so that they're representative and have the broadest possible views of the, of the right stakeholders for whatever the subject is. Next slide, please. So people join our committees to make a difference broadly. They do it for free. Um, they're volunteers. They very often pay their own way for everything, even traveling abroad. They, they do get involved in standards making for those kind of reasons of networking and continuing professional development, but also for, for some of these reasons on the slide. They may want to safeguard the public by ensuring safety or quality or security or privacy. They might want to improve performance in their sector, increase efficiency, control costs, 
costs, implement change, grow business. They might want to reduce business risk, increase resilience, improve security, to be interested in sustainability. Oh, I've got a slow network um, connection. I hope that's okay. I hope I'm still here. Um, you, anyway, lots of reasons why people moment, get involved. Though. Sorry, I'm muted. Oh dear, I have turned my fire stick off, all my phones, everything else. I don't know what else to do, really. Um, okay, over to you for the next slide. Thanks, Sarah. Next slide, please. Flora. Yes. Okay, so yeah, so I, hopefully um, Amanda can get some bandwidth back there for her for her um, her system. But meanwhile, um, just let me tell you a little bit about sort of the history of standards. I won't, I won't, just to give you a couple of examples, of ways in which standards evidently support the whole of our lives, essentially, or the infrastructure, the scaffolding, we call it here, of the modern economy. Um, it, it, they, they have best basically been the zeitgeist of, of, of the business environment, the economic environment for many, many years, um, more than a hundred years, of, as we said you know, earlier on, that the BSI has been around for, since 1901. Um, and it initially was engaged in work around uh, the sizes of steel, uh, the profiles of steel um, bars used for, for gauges in tram tracks and uh, to, to make that, you know, to, to rationalize the the, uh, the 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 trans um, the tram network in in which actually worked extra, extremely well, um, but but one of the, I think the thing that is um, for me one of the interesting things about uh, the way that standards are, are used is the the, uh, the success story of the ISO containers, which of course you you all have seen those those equally shaped containers on the on the, the decks of ships or piled up um, there was recently there was a problem with the Suez Canal blockage and you could see all these ships with the, the containers on them um, but from the mid mid 1900s that's the mid 20th century um, the uh, they made a change to uh, the whole way in which things were transported across across the world um, by by using by insisting on using these equally sized containers which help people to plan much more effectively it meant that equipment could be rationalized in all the ports around the world and it, it, it really resulted in an incredible um, you know, explosion of trade globally um, and productivity and jobs and for the economy but of course now now that things are changing again and we need to think a lot more seriously about how we transporting things the sustainability the carbon footprint of, of the way that we move things around the world that committee is thinking very much about um, the tracking issues the the, it, the resource um, points and where things can be saved and how you can you can ensure that that, that you can make things lighter so that you're making less of a, a footprint when you're moving things around uh, there's, there's some really interesting electronic um, tagging, tracking kind of work going on in that in that committee now, um, and um, and, the, and other things of course that you'll be aware of is that you know you have to have interoperability in a laptop. There are hundreds of standards being in in a laptop to ensure that they work together, and all laptops will will well, many laptops don't of course, but that, that they do in fact basically work uh, as a as a tool to get um, with others that are of similar make. Um, and of course, we put our credit cards into machines across the world and are able to withdraw money. And that is another another um, example of how of how standards have been in, you know, put into put into the things that we use every single day of our lives. Thanks, Sarah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, think, I think. Can you hear me? OK. Yes. Great. Um, I think it's really nice that you can see here the shipping containers example that you have committees that go on for decades, 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 yeah. decades. And very often some of the members stay for a really long time as well, because there's always something new, always some change that they want to have a standard on. Thanks for that. Next slide, please. Oh, this one as well, Sarah. Yes. So I just wanted to say a little, I, I mean, we've 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 probably mentioned most of these um, things that standards are you know capable of achieving already. So they they are about agreeing good practice. Um, they're basically an agreement. I mean, this is what they are. They're, they're not, um, there's nothing particularly rocket science-y about them, although obviously there are standards for rocket science, uh, but, they, but they are in fact about people coming together 
from every aspect of every you know, all the experts of every aspect of a topic or subject or new new technology and deciding something between them that, that will be good practice for now it doesn't mean that it will always be the case and that in use this will change so it's it's about a continuous improvement cycle as well so standards are always a journey rather than a point at which you stop um, which is why as we you know, mentioned just then about the the ISO container ship um, containers uh, committee things go on you know people have to keep thinking about the the, the consequences of, of what is what is there in in the in the environment um, so they are the distilled wisdom of all those experts they um, they can be about making a product a service um, they could be around a principle of, of you know how you how you ought to be thinking about the behavior of the organization about its resilience for example um, and they're very open and transparent anyone can get involved if they have a if they have a, a proper interest in it you know they have a they can prove that they they have something to say about it so there you are that's just a few things there i mentioned interoperability already thank you next slide And we are still me. So I just said there are lots of um, lots of ways in which standards uh, exist and what they you know the things that they can do. They're very flexible as a tool, um, in the sense that I already mentioned about certification, and we already talked about quality management systems as a as a standard that you've probably all heard of nine thousand and one. Um, and so those sorts of standards which have within them uh, measurable clauses, requirements, which can be proved by evidence. Those standards are known as um, normative standards. They're quite prescriptive. They can be used as the basis of um, schemes which third party certifiers, such as BSI or Lloyd's Register or others, can, can certify uh, organizations too. Um, and there are a couple of examples given here. Um, also, what we also refer to as normative standards are those where there are test methodologies. So those are often, again, very prescriptive. They have within them parameters for test. I think particularly in the food area, there's a lot of microbiological um, standards about you know, what, how much moisture there is in certain foods, for example. Um, and also vocabularies and terminologies, ways of classifying things. Those, those are very um, you know, very exacting, very exact, precise sorts of standards. The less prescriptive, the non-prescriptive or informative standards, we have a lot of those as well. We have probably more of those in many in many senses, or certainly more um, than are certified to. We have more of the kind of the codes of practice, the guidance standards, the standards around principles. So um, an example we've given here is the um, guidelines for phase implementation of an energy management system, for example. So this is a, a, a guidance standard that supports um, a, a more um, normative or prescriptive standard on energy management systems, one that can be certified to. Um, and we've also got this new standard that's recently come out, which I'm, Amanda, I know, is going to talk about a little bit later on um, organisational responses to modern slavery, which is, again, a, a very detailed standard about how about guidance on how you ought to think about that within your all of your supply chains actually can i just say a word on this because this is mm. this is kind of complex um and that uh, the first sort of top row of standards i think are normative standards so you you can get a certificate and i think a lot of people who come to bsi think that all all standards are like that you can get a certificate you can get certified against something but then but but we actually do loads of other standards so at the bottom row we call them informative standards and they're very much guidance and the benefit of those there's a really big benefit for small and medium-sized enterprises and i know that's your audience that you're interested in because actually they're a couple of hundred quid they you're not going to pay five or ten thousand pounds to be certified against it but you can follow a very similar standard to the bigger organizations your organization can follow it and really take on board some of the principles and the ways of being and the approach and the framework and all of that so lots of our guides are are, are guidance they are therefore fairly inexpensive for people to take on um, and that's really why we why we have two different ways of doing it is that fair sarah yeah, I, I think it's a very fair point to say that that you know not all standards you know and you don't have to certify to them anyway. It's all voluntary. 
there you've muted yourself Sarah I think Sarah I think you've muted yourself anyway we're pretty much finished on that slide so any questions anybody just put it in the chat just run out of power all this tech that we have to keep up with any questions we'll have lots of questions as we go throughout and then we'll have more questions at the end so please sort of save up your questions let's move on we hear you again Sarah can you hear us right unplug some things okay this one's me anyway so she can have a break to try and fix her tech so creating effective standards I think we can hear you Sarah I can hear you clicking see my fear around yeah no can't can you hear me there. yes can you see me good because I my, my headphones just packed up halfway through that so there we go <laughs> great all right so just looking at the little image on here we've got this top left we've got somebody saying my idea is and that's really anybody so anybody can suggest an idea for a new standard it could be someone who's at university it could be somebody starting out in their first job and they think oh, what is going on you know this needs a standard it could be somebody who's in the, been in a role a really long time um it could be someone from the, all those different stakeholders i talked about government consumers all of that can come up with an idea for a standard They'll put our, their idea to us and we will assess the idea and the sort of planning and approval. And then we'll approve the, pro and approve the project and it will be get created. And then we'll start probably putting together a committee. There may already be a committee. And if so, we say, you know, we get their comments and we get them to work on drafting a standard. And if not, we'll create a, a, a committee from scratch, which takes a lot of time and effort. Um, we'll go out and really, you know, network and find the right people to on this committee as, as we talked about all those different stakeholders. So we, we draft the standard, then it goes out for public consultation. So we've already had a you know, good representation of stakeholders working on it. But then we put it out to the public. We give three months, we do promote it as much as possible. Um, and please do you know, promote some of our, these things, um, any standards that you come across. If you see a consultation, do promote it to some of your audiences because we do want any comments. We then get in you know, tens or hundreds of comments and the committee will consider those comments. If there's huge numbers of comments, we may well have a second draft, but um, usually we will be able to finalise the draft and then put it out for a final approval and publish the standard. And then we will we will update that standard. We'll look at it again every three to five years and ensure it remains current and withdraw it if it doesn't or if another standard comes along that makes it obsolete. So the legitimacy of every standard is based on consensus and consultation. They are written by stakeholder experts, industry, government, consumers, and they undergo a systematic review to ensure continued validity. Excuse me. Next slide, please. Okay. Sarah's going to tell you a bit about standards and how they can support regulation. Sure. So um, I briefly touched on this. So you, there's often a bit of confusion with um, with standards and regulation as to, um, you know, people often think that standards are in some sense regulation, um, but they aren't, of course, they are entirely voluntary and separate, whereas legislation is mandatory. Um, it is the case that sometimes um, government will, particularly in the UK, will, um, will suggest that the use of the standard is, um, is a good route to compliance. Um, or, or, um, or can help to meet policy objectives. Um, now there is, for example, there are some government schemes such as the Energy Savings Opportunity Scheme for which using the energy management um, standard is, is considered a, a, a really good route to, in order to, to be able to, um, to qualify for that scheme. So that, um, that is a, a, you know, just one of those standards that is suggested but it's not the case that you have to do that you don't have to use that it's just that it's a really useful way because somebody has thought through all of those the committee members including people who are engaged in in um, regulation as well as you know, and industry and you know all other aspects of that particular area have thought about you know how this will work how the standard will work against um, how it will, you know, how it will support some of these issues um, that, that that are required by by governments. So that that is one aspect. The Environment Agency also talks about the um, the use of fourteen thousand and one as a as a good route to uh, be able to uh, uh, 
qualify for, for one of the for permit under the Environment Act. So it's it's uh, you know those those are sort of examples of how they might be used um, by uh, certainly by the UK government to to suggest a, a good route to complying with something. So they they are very much complementary to uh, legislation. But they are certainly not, um, and they must never contradict it in any way. And this is uh, this is across any aspect of what they do as well. It should be borne in you know, borne in mind that um, most standards have an, an outward focus, international focus. People are not just operating within the UK's borders. So there is very much this um, this opportunity with a standard where you're you've got um, a language being spoken in the standard, which is being spoken. Um, it, by others who are using that standard across the world, and so that is there is a there's a you know, that interoperability that uh, ability to to just to understand what somebody else means when they use a term uh, that is in a standard, for example, is is a really key part of of how standards can support a lot of efforts um, towards you know, good performance as well as legislation. So next slide, please. On the next slide, we've, we've just got a, 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 some of those things that I've, I've touched on there, just as a, a checklist for you. Um, so you'll get these slides, obviously, um, for reference. But, but another thing to point out is that obviously legislation is very much about a minimum requirement. So you know, you, get, you go to a point, and you know, the 30 mile an hour limit is a limit. Um, and also, legislation can't very well um, expand very much on, on what it what it needs. It needs to be very clear about very you know, quite simple things. You know, this is what we want you to do. Um, whereas with a standard, you can be much more. Um, it, it can give you a great deal more opportunity to to go above and beyond. So, although it won't ever contradict anything that is in legislation, it can help you comply with it but it can also give you that, that other um, step into something that's much more around the best practice of what you're doing better performance of your organization um, whilst at the same time retaining that, that you know, similarity so you, you're you're all talking a similar language when you're using the same sort of standard um, I think all of those other things we've mentioned about public consultation they're always voluntary and market led um, and you know they they are they can be supported through that measurement and testing and certification but they don't have to be that again is that is very much the choice of, of of those using them thanks very much could i so we've had a question from deborah asking if we could expand a little bit around standards and guides for smes um i don't know if that's already yeah, been, we, we're going to that. That. we're going to go on to that, that thanks. definitely yeah. thanks Next slide. I think we'll just jump on then, because I think we need to get into yeah. a bit more debated things. Yeah. So here's a little bit of that, the benefits of using standards again. I think maybe we'll just we'll do this really quick. So we've got lots of nice things like 28.4% of annual UK GDP growth can be attributed to standards equivalent to £8.2 billion. 41% um, of SMEs are more likely to export if they use standards. There's some nice facts there. And actually, the link at the bottom of that page has some more up-to-date ones. Next slide. Okay, we're just going to have another short video on benefits of standards and then we'll go into some specific standards. Okay, so here here is a, a few standards that I think your many of your clients would be interested in. So the energy management systems one, obviously everybody is concerned about energy management at the moment. Uh, where are we going? Okay, so this one is a, a free standard that Bayes has sponsored because as part of its uh, journey to net zero on its climate hub, it wanted to give away free copies of this energy management standards to up to 100,000 small and medium organisations in the UK. So do please send your customers to this page, get them to download the standard, and there's also guidance on this standard. Can we just scroll down a bit as well? I can't really see the page. There's a little video there that's quite useful. So this page is a nice one. It's in the slides. Um, don't play the video. It's fine. Uh, 
Okay, and there's some bonus. I'm just checking that the guide is still on there because I, I keep keep wanting keep, keep putting it back on. Anyway, very good standard on energy management. This is a phased approach to energy management. Sara talked about there being certifiable standards. So 50,001 is the certification standard, but this 50,005 was recently created just for small and medium-sized organizations. So it would really help them if they get a few people in a room to think about how they can reduce their energy costs, stop wasting energy, increase your efficiency, lower their carbon emissions, all of those kind of things. I'm going to show you a little game as well. So we go back to the slide. I'll show you. I think it's on another slide, actually. But there's a little game that we can send people to that then goes on to don't, don't move you for a second. That goes on to talking about the energy management standard that's free. Can we just have a look at Avara Foods case study? So just above the first link. So Sarah and I actually went out to visit this organization, a very large organization, and they had used ISO 50001, so the, the certification um, standard, and they'd used it as a route to complying with the ESOF scheme, the Energy Saving Efficiency Scheme, Opportunity Scheme. Um, if we scroll down to the very end of that, Flora Perry Knox score, we can see who you are, signed in with Google. Um, let's just have a look at what they felt they had gained over using the standard so avara had gained significant cost savings a tool to help more, win more business help with making a cultural transformation so when we spoke to the the energy management czar there at avara she went around all the different bits of plant in this very large poultry manufacturing organization and people would see her coming and say, oh, hi, Bashaki, hi, hi, yes, we've turned the lights off, yes, we've done this, yes, we've put some sensors on this production line. And so people were really involved in, in what they could do to save energy. And that, that was clearly a benefit of using the standard. So back to this slide, slide again. And I, I think just, just quickly to say that although Avara is a large organisation, this, this is a really, you know, important thing that this, this you know, ability to take your, your organisation, how no matter how big or small it is, through a systematic approach. And so, and, and it's particularly useful for smaller businesses who are yeah. not necessarily looking for certification. Yeah, so culture change is really quite a key thing. And actually, we see that again in the next link, which is sustainable events, ISO 2012-1. So this was a nice standard done in 2012 for the 2012 Olympics, hence its name. And we're now looking at revising it for, for the French Olympics in 2024. So it will still be ISO 2012-1, but it will be colon 2024 when it publishes. Can we, can we have a look at that um, case study on the link, sustainable events link? Thank you. So we we talked to an embassy in Rome who, who were very keen to talk about how transformational um, this standard had been for them. So again, they're, they're actually quite a small organisation. They were just one embassy, but they had got their whole team together and really worked to see how they could improve the sustainability of their events. And that's really what they're in the business of, running events, you know, day in, day out, really. And they've done all sorts of things like change, you know, removing any need for disposable crockery and, and cutlery, and they'd installed a charging point and all sorts of things. But if we just scroll down a little bit, there's a couple of nice things. So there's a similar case study, written case study, down a little bit more. So there's a case study there, but there's also a video. Um, actually, we'll just quickly play the video because I think we've got that lined up. But there's also a written case study on that. And, and, and what they have to say is really about changing the culture, changing everybody involved to want to get involved in, um, in improving whatever aspect this film is covered. Can we play that video? That video isn't lined up for today. Oh, that's session. fine. Let's just have a quick look. Make sure that it's sent out. No, no problem. Just have a look at the case study about the British Embassy in Rome then. So there's a paper case study as well. Um, and this is how they're talking about how they really embedded sustainability and then loads of things. Switch from fossil fuels to 100% renewable energy. Scrolling down a little bit to the second page. Um, they inspired and motivated staff, created a culture of sustainability, knowledge sharing. Um, they were able to introduce the staff to new ideas and concepts. And then scrolling down to the very last bit, YBSI. So the British Embassy in Rome has gained significant cost savings, more teamwork and employee motivation, improved communication on sustainability with suppliers and clients, and enhanced reputation within the FCDO and with internal and Italian stakeholders. So they were pretty thrilled with 
what that standard had done for them. And back to the slide, thanks. There are so many standards it is quite hard for us to tell you where to get started, but I know that you, there's a website that Elaine has curated um, and you have access to our BSI knowledge tool where you can go around and have a look at standards. But some of the some of them we have been mentioning, so 9001 quality management, 14001 environmental management, this one 50,005 free to everybody. So, you know, by all means, this is a very strong standard for all SMEs. 2012-1, if people are in the hospitality sector, worth looking at. Um, a last one I think it's I've just published, so it's on modern slavery. Can we have a look at that first free British standard? Very exciting that BSI decided as part of its purpose it would make this standard available for free download because organisations large and small can actually you can find an issue of modern slavery anywhere. But this really put uh, gives you a very broad framework to addressing modern slavery in your organisation and in your supply chain. Let's scroll down a little bit more, please. So you can download the free standard here. Your clients and yourselves can download an executive briefing as well. Yeah, back to the slides, thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Oh, it's me. Sorry, so just to talk a little bit about, really briefly about the how how standards support innovation, which I've already kind of touched on, where I, I mentioned that, you know, we, we do a lot of work with Innovate UK um, around helping sort of new areas of work emerge, you know, from different sectors, particularly, you know, obviously there's a lot of change in the agri, agri sector at the moment. Um, and, you know, the for example, you know, uses of new proteins, you see, see seaweed being used to uh, as a diff, uh, as a, a source of um, omega-3 um, and, you know, the, they, you know, lots and lots of different sorts of, you know, obviating the need obviously to use fish stock um, in that respect. So lots of different things going on in that space. But they, what's interesting here is that a lot of people often say to us, well, um, you know, it might, it's just too soon. We're, we're, we're still at the early stage. It's far too soon to think about standards, but actually it, it's never really too soon to think about how how you're going to support, give and give structure and um, you know, help that, um, that new work go from the research into real world implementation. Um, and there's a lot of work that we've, um, the, that we've referenced here that you can have a look at to give you some sense as well about how how those things can really really help to give that boost and and, and help the scale up that, that businesses need uh, particularly the small ones you know the, the one i mentioned um you know, creating um omega three um from seaweed using uh, waste material from from the brewery industry that was you know very much uh you know very small business but they're very much scaling up using um you know work around standards using things uh, responsible innovation uh, so i think that's what it's called but i'll pass you over to elaine in a moment which will give me the actual title it's something that we did with innovate um and uh, there's another uh, reference here to um paget the proportionate and adaptive governance of innovative technologies research from the Inigen institute which uh, was done by dr joyce tate uh, Edinburgh University and her colleagues to show that actually, you know, regulators need standardization, you know, to have started to, they need, they need some structure in order to understand where they need to start to think about you know, where the bounds of regulation should be. So it's, it's a, it's a very important um, stage in, in innovation is, is working with, with those who need to map out where we need to go for the future. So, um, in fact, Elaine, did you, did, I think you, Elaine has already mentioned that there will be some an innovative man, innovation management courses available. So I won't necessarily um, ask her to come in now, but um, but I think that Joyce Tate is going to be running those um, running a course on that, which will be available. And she mentioned up front that there will be some other courses that you could you could uh, look to. So unless Elaine wants to say anything else about that, we could probably. Do you want to say anything, Elaine, or should we move to the next slide? No, that, that's perfect. Yeah, just okay. um, to get through those dates, they will be coming up in the next two months. Um, so she'll be looking 
task for 40, which was responsible innovation um, and sharing more about that standard as well as general responsible or innovation management themes. Thanks. That's right. Responsible innovation, that was the title, and that, that was very much the, the standard that, that that small business that I mentioned used to help them to go to understand what the unintended consequences might be of, of the work that they were doing and how to communicate and to reassure their investors as well. So next stage, please. Slide, rather, not stage, slide. And this is just just to sort of summarise some of those things that I, I, I've sort of touched on there about the, the quality and safety, the performance. I've already talked about compatibility and interoperability, the importance of that if, if you are going to start something. Um, and you know, the, the contribution to organisational behaviour really helps to create that, that sort of more equitable relationship in, in, in new areas of work as well. Uh, next slide, please. And th this is just a few um, things which you can find on our website, which I think might also you know, find useful when you're talking to um, smaller businesses, because a lot of them will be engaging in this in, in, in new, the new economy and thinking about the net zero and how they can really assist that decarbonisation push with their with, with whatever it is that they are now doing in their enterprises um, and so the the work that we've done with there have been several programs of work around um, as you see the EV battery development so how how people can back to interoperability to be able to plug in your your, your car your vehicle to in, into certain points there needs to be infrastructure developed around that it needs to it all needs to be thought through how that should be done in the most effective way, the most resource saving way, uh, resource being you know both both of, of um, you know, sustainability in sustainability terms as well as others. Um, and then of course there's work on energy smart appliances, um, and materials in general, smart mobility, all of these you'll see there are quite big programs of work. And again, they started very early. So you know in this sort of with the researchers, with the academics, with, with those who are engaging in the industry and, and new, new parts of this work, to think about, to really roadmap, where, where will we go in the future? What will be needed going down the line rather than, than right now? You know, we need a, a, you know, a safety one now, but we need, you know, we need terminology. But what else? You know, where, where will we be going in the future? And that was very much something around the connected automated vehicles work. So the idea was that we really wanted to to provide the with the UK with a <clears throat> with a real head start in a sense, a real um, give, make this make the UK a centre of excellence to to share its um, disseminate its knowledge and information and expertise, as well as be seen as a as a as a guiding you know a guiding light in a sense for for the way that you should you should do these things, uh, to carry out trials, ensure that things are safe uh, and secure in 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 those vehicles. Um, and so there is, uh, we did a lot of work with the Connected Places cap Catapult, the uh, Department for Transport. And, you know, we've, we've done a lot of sort of post research on some of those early pieces of work, or those passes on trials, for example, to and on terminologies to see that actually they're being, this work is being downloaded across the world. People are looking to to what the UK is doing, and it's, it's a really interesting um, sort of model if you like for, for the future for the future industry and for future industry that is really based around decarbonisation and, and, and different ways of, of, of running an economy. Next so just a quick poll for you. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on what you think are examples what are the you know examples of how standards can enable innovation. Give you a couple of moments to, to have a think about what you think is uh, what you consider the priority pieces there. Um, you can answer obviously more than one. And I'll give you a moment and, and find out what you think. Flora, so we, has everyone done? I think. Sorry, we can't see who's voting. There we go. 
yeah um great um i uh, yes you spot, spotted the most of you spotted the, the the slightly trick question which is preventing competitors i mean obviously you know that that is something we hear that people think that it is about you know stopping people from entering the market but actually really we're, we're trying to level the playing field and make it easier for particularly for smaller um, organizations to be able to play alongside the, the larger ones you know so so that is a, you know a key part of what we're supposed to be doing with, with standards to clarify and to simplify a market to to help people to really be able to engage creatively with it um so um obviously uk competitive advantage was, was something i spoke about there for connected auto, automated vehicles but that was more about you know how we how we may manage to take that out into the world um and it's it's you know in our knowledge economy so this is uh, an important po point uh, an important part of what we do standards is take knowledge out next okay thanks sara so how can standards support smes yes i am unmuted <laughs> Well, we think they can level the playing field. So in your case, I think you have free access to some standards, but generally for a couple of hundred pounds, small and medium sized enterprises can play with all the bigger players as well, the bigger organizations. Standards ensure clarity, simplify complexity, lay out key principles and characteristics, and allow for creativity from entrepreneurs and innovators. They do not tell you what you have to do. They tell you what, they give you a, an, an idea of an approach so that you can you can deliver your on, on the standard in your own way a really nice example is bs 8001 which if you hover over it flora can tell me the title i should put it on the slides i can't remember it but it's a framework of the principles for implementing the principles of the circular economy in organizations and if you have a small or medium size a very small company particularly that that's a really good starting point to have a look at that standard because it it sets out what a circular organization would look like and how it would behave and how it would work with others so that's a really nice standard next slide please okay and here's a few other nice little links for you for for small businesses so the first link is the small business guide to standards that's the pdf that can you be downloading the next one is the small business blog which has lots of different articles um, jumping the next one, then there's a little book of Net Zero, um, really, really nice uh, little book for people to read. And there's other other little books there in the lane. Hopefully you'll put them now on their landing page. Um, the other the quality management, health and safety management, they're just very nice little things to download and think, OK, do I need this standard? Does this, will this work for me? But let's have a look at the link that says SME Net Zero Challenge, because this is one that you could do with your SMEs right now. I'll get them to have a play with. And this is this is really to, to take them on a journey to thinking, OK, yes, I'll go and download the the 50,005 standard, the energy management standard. But this little tool, this little game is going to help people to do, to think about all the things they might do to manage their energy better. So let's say we're working in consumer service for a um, we're a fairly, let's say we're a fairly small organization, 11 to 50 staff. Um, and then we've got sort of, meet, meet, let's say we've got a small space. Let's go for a small space and see what comes up. And the fraction of the food service revenue, let's say a lot. Yeah, go for it. And then we'll, so this is, this is who we are, who we think we are. And it says here, this is where all of our typical greenhouse gas emissions are going. So we've got something on heating something on cooling lighting food and other and then there's best practice and this is based on data um that has been put together on a lot of data so it should sort of work and if we click on how it works it should really say play shouldn't it anyway we're going to look at your emissions and we're going to give you some tokens to spend and then you can see what tokens work and how that really reduces your emissions so get started OK, so I've got five tokens to spend. I'm going to use one on improving staff awareness because I know that standards are really good at that. Then we'll have a look at the twos, two, so two token ones. And we'll, yeah, well, any two of those that you fancy. Yeah, we'll put some sensors and timers in and we'll convert to LED lighting. So let's see what impact that has had. So look at the next period. I think this is, so it's not to six months. It's each period is six months. So you're looking at two year program here. And we can see we 
start where we started. We can see like, currently we have made some improvements, but we're nowhere close to best practice. So we need to do a lot more, frankly. Yeah, let's pick some other things. Lovely environmental control system, whatever you want. Um, but hopefully this should give that kind of organization some ideas, really. Um, next period, yeah. And let's see, we're still improving, but we're not close to best practice. So we're going to carry on, spend what tokens we have on the final two. Lovely. And actually, we're very close to best practice, but we've got one more start, one more little point. Yeah, we'll have a upgrade our cooking and refrigeration. And we'll do some more things. OK, so now we've actually done much better than best practice. So after two years, you've reduced your greenhouse gas emissions by 15.7 tonnes. And let's click, click close. And let's see. I think it's next. Yeah, we can have a look at our energy bill. Yes, you're right. Yeah, have a look at our energy bill. Obviously, this isn't quite taking into account the way energy is going to go up. <laughs> All the wonderful data that we put into it couldn't quite predict that. And then we'll look at our cost chain. Yes, have a look at our emission savings. Yeah, and then let's have a look at the recap business profile. Does it carry on? Let's close it, yeah. And then we close it. Mm. I thought it should take us to a, a link to actually going to the 50,005 download, so apologies for that. I'll, I'll find out why that's not working. But that basically is just a nice tool for people to use if they're interested in improving their carbon and energy. Uh, next slide, please. Is this the final slide? I think it probably is. Yeah, so um, can you unmute everybody, Flora? And I think you probably then have to unmute yourselves as well. So do sort of jump in. Hopefully we've given you an idea of what standards are, who BSI is, how we make standards, why standards are pretty good for people. You know, we're obviously quite enthusiastic about them. It, it is difficult to advise you exactly how to get started with them because I would, people, smaller organizations probably start from a subject matter viewpoint so if they're in automotive they might start with those kind of standards and then they might go on to some of the overarching standards like sustainability and quality and health and safety um, but other large organizations might go in with a new just looking at hey let's have a look at one slavery now this is this is interesting this is free let's have a look the energy management one this is interesting this is free let's see how standard works i think we find standards are written in the same way they have a very nice standard format so once you use one, it's very easy to take on another one. Yeah, we've got some chat. Hi, everybody. Flora, have we got anybody wanting to chat today? We're unmuted, but people are typing probably. Yeah, it's an okay. Flora, probably better to mute people then. Um, yeah, I, I've unmuted everyone so everyone can hopefully unmute themselves. Yeah, any questions? Okay, if we don't have any questions, you will be getting the slides. There's lots of nice links on there for you to have a look at. And uh, in particular, uh, this first, fourth slide, I think it is, um, Elaine's slide, will give you a link to where you can look at the standards online. But lots yeah, of Deborah others. asked how, how they can access the slides. Um, but yeah, they'll be they'll be sent around to you um, as well a video of today's session. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll say bye bye then. Thanks.